Well, hey, good morning, everybody. No matter where you're watching from, online, out at our south location, or here in Tulsa, great to see you guys this morning. Hey, real quick, before we get started, before we jump into the final message in this series, My Unforgettable Life, I want to give a quick shout out to our Lincoln Christian High School football team who won their game Friday night. <laughs> Big deal. So many of you were out there cheering them on. It was a little bit cold Friday night, but thanks for being there. Hey, I want to invite you out uh, this Friday night to Cushing because we play Cushing at Cushing uh, this Friday, and uh, we want to be there to turn their home field advantage into our home field advantage like we did a few weeks ago at Berry Hill when uh, almost we had more fans there at Berry Hill than, than, than they did, and certainly we were, we were more rowdy than they were. We want to do that at Cushing uh, this Friday night, so if you can... If you're not serving at Christmas Train or if you don't have uh, kids of your own in another school that you're going out to support, uh, do us a favor, show up at Cushing, help us make some noise and, uh, and turn their home field advantage into our home field advantage and cheer uh, our Bulldogs on as they head towards a, uh, a state championship. That's what we'd love to see. So anyways, thanks for helping us out with that. Hey, today we are uh, wrapping up this series called My Unforgettable Life. This is part three of that series. And if you weren't here for the previous two weeks, um, this is how kind of this series got started. I was reading through the Gospel of John, the account of John. John was one of Jesus' disciples. He spent about three years with Jesus. And when you come to the end of the Gospel of John, specifically when you come to the very last verse, this is what you read. I thought this was an interesting verse. Look what it says. It says that there are many other things. So John's saying, I was with Jesus for three years, and I saw him do a lot of stuff. And I wrote a lot of it down in this, in this book. But if I was to write it all down, everything that I saw, if I was to write it all down one by one, I suppose that not even the world itself could contain the books that would be written. John was with Jesus for about three years, and he saw so many extraordinary things that he said the world couldn't even contain the books that would be written if I was to try, try and write it all down. Now, there's no doubt about it, whether you think Jesus was the Son of God or whether you have questions about that or not, there is no doubt that Jesus left an immeasurable impact on our world. In fact, I would argue that no other human being in the history of our world has had more impact than Jesus did. I mean, we divide our calendar by Jesus. You know, B.C. and A.D. Here in just a few weeks, we'll celebrate his birth. Worldwide, globally, people will celebrate the birth of one guy who lived a couple thousand years ago. Uh, I, mean, I mean, just immeasurable impact over and over and over again. This weekend, millions of people will gather all over the world in rooms like this to learn about him, to worship him. So, I mean, this guy, Jesus had just an amazing impact on, on our world. And John said, if I was to try and write down everything that I saw, just I saw in three years, the world can contain the books. So it got me to thinking, you know, what, what kind of impact would my life have. If I was to write down or ask you to write down everything that you knew of me, what would that fill? Would it fill a book or a chapter of a book or maybe a brochure? What would, what would, I, what would it be able to fill? And this is really the question that we've been kind of wrestling with through this series. It's a pretty simple question, but I think it's a thought-provoking question. Is What is it that you're known for? What are you known for? What do people know you for? When they bump into you out wherever it is that you go, when you're going out to lunch or you know, you're, you're out on the town, whatever it is, when people bump into you in your neighborhood, what is it that they think about you? What is it that they, that they know you for? What, what, what do they think about when they think about you? And then I ask the question, we've been asking the question sort of a little bit larger, kind of in a corporate sense. What do people know of Church on the Move? When people think about our church, when they see that bumper sticker on the back of your car, or, or Church on the Move comes up in a conversation, what is it that, that people are struck with? And, and one of the things that we've talked about throughout this series is just that for many of us, and as I've talked to many of you, and as I've talked to many of our staff, the thing that comes up over and over again when people think of Church on the Move is, it's big. That's what people know about our church, is that it's a big church. And there's nothing wrong with being a big church. We just want to be a big church that makes a big impact. But what is it that we should be known for? What is it that people ought to know us for? And Jesus defined it for us. So if you call yourself a follower of Christ or a Christian, Jesus laid it out for us. He gave us no other option. He said, this is what you're supposed to be known for. In fact, this comes from, from John. John recorded this in the 13th chapter and verse 35. Look what he said. He said this, that by all people, this is Jesus talking. He said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In other words, the defining characteristic of a Christian, of somebody who calls themselves a Christian, isn't their morality, isn't their faith isn't their beliefs, it's how they love. Not to say those other things aren't important, but what we should be known for above all else 
is our love. How, how, how are we known by our love? And so that's been, been what we've been talking about throughout this series. It's just we want to be a big church that's known for making a big impact by loving big. And over the last couple of weeks, so many of you have been involved in doing just that. I want to share just a few things with you of just kind of what's been happening in our church, whether you know about this or not. Some really cool things have been happening as part of our section serving opportunities and some of the, the giving projects that we've been doing, some really cool stuff. This first picture comes from this service, actually. It's Johnny and Crystal Hampton's section. This is uh, section 3B, which is right, is this section 3B right here? How are you guys doing, 3B? You guys, many of you, ran in the and helped support the uh, crisis pregnancy outreach 5K that happened, I guess, last weekend. This is them running. This is, I, I love this because they're all wearing their church on the move headbands. I don't even know where you can get a church on the move headband. They had them made, I guess. So that's really cool. They went out and did that. Uh, here's the next picture. This is really cool. This comes from Saturday night, James and Sarah Cruz's section, 6 uh, A and B. Also, I think Chris and Brenda Oaks are a part of this as well, which is right over here on Saturday night. They got together and they donated school supplies for schools, local schools in need. And this is so cool because what they're doing in this picture is they're gathering around these school supplies, laying their hands on them and praying over these school supplies before they donate them. I think that's great. Uh, here's, here's section, uh, uh, let's see, this is section 4A from Saturday night, 6 p.m. This is uh, Vinny, or uh, Greg and Amy Vinnerholm. Uh, they're serving at the, uh, the, the, the Eastern Oklahoma Food Bank. That's great. Here's another one. Uh, this was from Saturday at 4 p.m. This is a, a group of people from uh, Philip and Sarah Villa Real section. They're serving at the Tulsa Day Center, passing out clothes, praying with people, just serving in really great, remarkable ways. So many of our sections are plugged in and serving. And then there's this one here that I think is great. This is Emily Cook. And Emily, she's not a section leader. She just organized the girls of her house-to-house -house group and some other friends. And they got together and they went to this coffee shop. And they wrote letters to girls who had been, uh, who, who are coming out of uh, sex, the sex trafficking trade. These are girls who have been rescued out of that, and they're now in homes for recovery. And they're writing them letters just to encourage them and to tell them that they're praying for them. This is remarkable what's happening in our sections and in our church. I think it's fantastic. And then out at our south location, so many of you guys out there partnered together to sow into and give into uh, Glenpool, the, the local Glenpool schools, and there are a lot of kids, I guess, in that area who have just needs of basic necessities, like, you know, pants and shoes and coats, and many of you got together, and you gave, and you donated uh, clothing for these kids in need out at Glenpool, and uh, you, you gave it to them, and one of you, I guess, caught it on video on your, on your iPhone. Anyways, we have a little video that we'd like to share with you. This is uh, us making a donation out at Glenpool, so check this out. I'm one of the counselors at Glenpool, and my goodness, I am overwhelmed. So I'm trying not to cry. Sometimes, just to give a, a child a new pair of shoes or a coat makes all the difference in their world. So thank you. You are the hands of Jesus. Thank you. It's amazing. This is what being a big church is all about. Let me just say something. Church is not about you supporting us, the professional ministers, so that we can do all the, the ministry. We get to do all the work. No, 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 no. The church is about us supporting and empowering you so that you can do the work of the ministry. That's what Church on the Move is all about. And it's happening all over our church. It's great. And let me tell you one last story. Um, there's a lady in our church that when she heard about what we were wanting to do for Cooper Elementary School, she wanted to get involved. And she asked that, and when I tell this story, that I, uh, she remain anonymous, so we're just going to call her B. And when B heard what we wanted to do for Cooper, she went to Leanne Scott. Leanne is, uh, she heads up our solo moms ministry, but also uh, she's been uh, strategically involved in interacting with these schools and finding out what they need and which schools are in need. And so uh, B went to, to Leanne and she just asked, hey, tell me about this Cooper project. What's it going to cost 
to do everything that we're wanting to do at Cooper Elementary School. For those of you who don't know, Cooper is at an elementary school about three miles from right here at this uh, location, our Tulsa campus. Uh, it's just about three miles away. It's a school with a lot of needs. We wanted to go over there and resurface their basketball court, get their basketball goals just replace them really. They're broken down. They need a new basketball goals. They're wanting to put in a garden and a walking path. There's just some projects that they're wanting to do. And so, so B asked Leanne just, you know, how much is all this going to cost? And Leanne said, well, I think it's going to cost around $20,000. This is part of our giving initiative that we've been doing for this month. And uh, she told her, I think it's going to cost about $20,000. B got out her checkbook and on the spot wrote a check for $20,000. Incredible. Now let me tell you the rest of the story. The reason why she was so moved to do that was because B attended Cooper Elementary School. When she was growing up, she was abused physically and sexually. And for B, going to Cooper where the teachers were so kind to her and loved on her so much was really the only safe place she said she really had in her life. And when she heard that it was in disrepair and that it wasn't doing so well, she wanted to pitch in and help however she could. And she said she thought it was so cool to see Church on the Move wrapping its arms around this little elementary school because, in her words, she said, this might be the only Jesus some of these kids ever know. You never know what's going on in the lives of these kids and what kind of a difference we're making what they're dealing with every day, but we get to have an impact, and that's what being a big church is all about. It's about making a big difference, and so to all of you who are participating in this, who've served in sections, who've signed up to serve at Christmas Train, you've contributed financially, I just want to say a big, fat thank you to everybody who's participated. I think you're worth a big round of applause. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you. Well, today, as we kind of come to the end of this, this little series, I want to talk a little bit about this week because really I, this is a great week, one of my favorite weeks of the year. This is Thanksgiving week, so I hope you've got some great Thanksgiving plans. Hope you've got some time set aside you're going to go spend with family, hopefully eat some turkey, take a nap after you eat the turkey, and then you get to turn on the TV and watch the annual uh, uh, downward slide of the Dallas Cowboys begin. <laughs> It's an annual tradition, and it starts this week. Isn't it interesting, though? So Thanksgiving is on Thursday. I think this is interesting because Thanksgiving is Thursday, and Thanksgiving is that, you know, it's the time of year where we're supposed to be thankful, right? I mean, we're supposed to, we're supposed to sit around and talk about what we're thankful for, or maybe that's something that you do in your family where you kind of, you talk about, maybe you go around the table and everybody says, you know, takes turns talking about what they're thankful for. And it might be a little cheesy, but it's the time of year where you do that kind of thing, where you sit back and you go, hey, this is what I'm thankful for. But what I think is interesting is that Thanksgiving is now butted right up against this other holiday that has sort of emerged in the last few years that is, to me, just such a contrast of what's happening on Thanksgiving. And that's Black Friday. This day where just 24 hours earlier, we're thankful for what we do have. And then just, just a few short hours after, we're so thankful for what we do have. We claw and we scratch and we kick and we will cut you if necessary <laughs> to get what we don't have yet. What a contrast of days this is. This, that they're right next to each other that we do this. And I'm not saying that you are, you know, an evil person if you've got your whole Black Friday schedule. I get it. There's some great deals to be had on that. But I, I just think it's such an interesting contrast. And I think it speaks to human nature of this sort of tug of war that goes on on the inside of each one of us. Between being thankful and content with the things that we do have and being ambitious and unsatisfied for the things that we wish we had and the things that we want. I think this is a battle that I have, that you have, all of us have. It's this internal struggle, again, between the things that we're thankful for, the things that we do have. It's on the one hand, 
We know we should be thankful. We know we should, we should be content with what we have. And on the other hand, there's a drive, there's a pull towards achieving more, getting more, having a bigger house, having a larger income, all the things that we wished we had in life. There's this internal struggle, and never is it more, I think, obvious than with Thanksgiving and Black Friday, that there's this internal struggle. And so here's what I want to do. This is going to be a really simple message this weekend, but here's what I've noticed, that the things that are always simple in life, in fact, the simple stuff is usually the hardest stuff. Have you noticed that? We know that, you know, that if you want to lose weight and get healthy, the way to do that is to eat good and exercise. That's really simple. It is not easy for those of you who have tried. I know how that is. It's not easy, especially this time of year. It's not easy to eat right and exercise. So often the simple stuff is, 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 is the hardest stuff. So just because this is simple doesn't mean that it's easy, but it's something that I think that if we'll all do, it, it'll change our perspective on the way that we live, and I think will make us better, ultimately happier people. And all I really want to get you to do, and the bottom line of the whole message, I don't normally do this, but I'm going to just give it to you up front. So if you want to take a nap through the rest of this, be my guest. But here's what, I, here's what I'm trying to get you to do. If there is a struggle, if there is a tug of war between what we should be thankful for and this drive to achieve more, and here's the deal. Neither one is bad. In fact, you need both in, in your life because you want to be content with what you have, but there also should be a pull to achieve more. Otherwise, you just sit around and you do nothing with your life. There is a natural ambition that I think is a good thing, but there's this struggle and it's a tension kind of pulling in both directions. You don't want to resolve it either way. You don't want either side to fully win. But if I could get you to do one thing this weekend, here's what it would be. It would just be to get you to lean toward thankfulness. That's all I want you to do, is just lean toward, if you could live your life leaning toward thankfulness, that would be my goal. In fact, here's what I want us to do just as we kind of get started. If thankfulness is over here, this is what I want us to do. You're here, you're watching out at our South location, everybody together, I want you to just lean this direction with me. Would you just lean? Let me see you lean. Come on, lean this way. Let's say lean towards thankfulness together. You ready? Lean toward thankfulness. That's, that's what I want you to do. I want you, you're never going to resolve this tension. You're not going to, you're not going to be one or the other. What I want you to do is just lean in the direction of thankfulness. That's, that's, that's all I'm trying to get you to do. Now, here's why this matters. There was a guy who, in scripture, you've heard of him, Moses, the guy who went to Pharaoh and said, hey, let my people go. God used Moses to do some amazing things, and Moses was a leader, Moses led a lot of people, and he knew a lot about human nature. And Moses is coming to the end of his, his leadership tenure. He's, he's, about to, he's about to die, quite honestly. He's coming to the end of his life, and he's gathered together all the leadership of Israel, and he's, he, he's kind of giving them a talking to, just letting them know sort of what they need to keep in mind. And you can read about all this if you're interested in Deuteronomy, the first four chapters specifically kind of go over this. It's Moses' sort of farewell address. And you can imagine all the different things that Moses had been through. In fact, he spends chapters one, two, and three talking about everything that he'd seen. He's, he's talking with these people and he's saying, hey, you remember what God did? Remember how that he, he brought us out of Egypt? Remember what happened in Egypt and the amazing things? Do you remember when we crossed the Red Sea? Do you remember when, when God spoke to us at Mount Sinai and he gave us the Ten Commandments? So he's He's recounting all these incredible things that he's seen and witnessed. And many of these people or their parents saw these things. They witnessed them firsthand. And then in chapter 4, he, he takes a turn. He stops remembering and he starts giving them some advice. He starts warning them about a few things that they got to watch out for because they're about to go on without him. He's not going to be leading them anymore. And he's saying, hey, this is some stuff you need to watch out for. And so Deuteronomy chapter 4, if you've got a smartphone or a Bible or whatever and you want to follow along, it's Deuteronomy chapter 4. This is verse 9. And this is what Moses says to them. He says this. He's telling them, he says, only take care. Be careful now. Watch this. And keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Moses is speaking to this tension that all of us have on the inside of us, this internal struggle, that we have this ambition, we have this drive for more. In fact, we live our lives in a sort of state of 
dissatisfaction, don't we, that we want a little bit more. There's nothing wrong with wanting to achieve more, that one day I'm going to be in that position. There's nothing wrong with that. But Moses is saying this. He's saying, listen, you got to be careful because there's something on the inside of you and there's something on the inside of me. It's in your soul that if you don't watch it, you will naturally lean in the opposite direction. You'll lean towards dissatisfaction. You'll lean towards the, just fulfilling all of your ambitions, seeking everything that it is that you want. You'll lean towards that direction. And when you do, you will forget everything that has been done. See, Moses understood our human nature. He knew that our, that our, that our propensity, he knew that these people's propensity was to forget everything good that had happened in their life, to only focus on what they don't have yet. Moses understood this. He knew that inside of you and inside of me, there's a hole, there's a void, there's a gap so big that we'll constantly seek to fill it. And he knows that it's so easy for us to just take all of our ambitions, all of our struggles, all the things that we're after and try to fill that hole. And we know instinctively that we can't do that. When we say things like, you know, money can't buy happiness, but that doesn't stop us from trying. Think about it. We're the most in-debt society, perhaps, in the history of the world. I've been there. We've bought stuff with money that we don't have, stuff that we don't need. We've spent money on it. Why? We're, we're, it's just stuff that we want. We're seeking to fill a gap that can't be filled with stuff. But that's how we live our lives. And it's easy to slip over into this, and that's what Moses understood, that if you're not intentional about it, you will just automatically lean in the direction of the things you don't yet have. That's how a lot of us live our lives, just searching for that next thing. I'll be happy when I get that promotion. I'll be happy when we're just making a little bit more money, when our house is just a little bit bigger, then I'm going to be happy. When we can get this done, when we can get that done, then, then I'll really be satisfied. It doesn't work like that. Isn't it interesting, have you ever known someone who had a brush with death, came really close to dying? Maybe you had an experience like that. You ever known somebody that just came right up against death or maybe had a really bad diagnosis or something and you just were told that you, you, know, you were right on the edge or you were near death? Have you ever been around somebody like that? Isn't it interesting how when you brush up against death a little bit that it totally reshifts all of your priorities? Isn't that interesting? When you meet somebody like that, it's interesting to some of the things they say. They come back and they say things like, you know, I didn't realize just how precious each day is. Sometimes it takes just a big, overwhelming experience like that to shake us out of this propensity that we have to focus on what we don't yet have. And for many of us, that's how we live our lives. It's in this sort of limbo, this place of, I'm not there yet. I, I, we're waiting until we get there. Then I'll be satisfied. When I get there, that's when everything's going to be really good for me. And the truth is that most of us go our whole lives never achieving everything that we hope to achieve. We don't, we don't, we don't get to check every box on our list. We don't get to achieve all of our goals. Most of us live our whole lives that way. And so when we go to our graves feeling a little unsatisfied, we, we think it's because we didn't achieve everything. But it's interesting when you look at people who have achieved everything they ever wanted to achieve in life, when you study their lives after all their dreams came true, it's interesting what you find out. There was a lady, Cynthia Heimel, she wrote for the Village Voice. She wrote this in a column several years back, and Cynthia knew people in New York who were famous. She knew them after they were famous, and she knew them, though, before they were famous, when they were working at the counter at Macy's, and they were struggling to be famous. And she met these people, she knew these people, and these were people who had become crazy famous, not just a little bit famous, but worldwide, all your dreams come true kind of fame. And this is what these people were in pursuit of. And look at what she wrote. This is what she wrote. She wrote this. She said that giant thing that they were striving for, that fame thing that was going to make everything okay, that was going to make their lives bearable, that was going to fill them with ha ha happiness, had happened. And the next day, they woke up and they were still them. The disillusionment turned them howling and insufferable. See, this is how we live our lives. Most of us never get everything that we're after. 
So we think that that gnawing feeling of feeling like maybe one day we'll get there, that, that, that hole that we have in the inside of us is just because we haven't achieved all of our dreams yet. But what Cynthia observed, and this lady isn't necessarily a Christian woman, but she just observed that the people who had all their dreams came, come true, they were just as miserable as the rest of us. They were just as unhappy, they were just as unsatisfied, even after everything that they had achieved. And this is how we live our lives. A lot of us, we lean towards what we wished we had. And we live in this place of limbo, feeling like that if our situation was just a little bit better, then we would be happy. If my husband was just a little bit better, if I could get, just get him to pay attention to me a little bit more, if I could get, just get my wife to do this, if I could just get my boss to do this, when we come up with all kinds of reasons, all kinds of situations that we fantasize about when we're by ourselves. We think about what it would be like to live a particular way. And we think that when we have that, that, that things will be great, that we'll finally be satisfied. But here's the truth, and this is something that I've learned, and I think it might set you free a little bit. It's this, that the perfect situation isn't perfect. We tell ourselves that it is, but it's not perfect. James, who was the half-brother of Jesus, can you imagine being the brother of Jesus? Like what kind of pressure that would be to have Jesus as your older brother, always being compared to Jesus? I mean, for real, that would be so hard. That was James' situation, and James, he wrote in his his, his letter, which is in uh, uh, the New Testament, James wrote this. He said that the word of God, that the scripture is like a mirror. That's what I love about the Bible. If you don't read the Bible, you should read the Bible because the Bible tells you a lot about yourself. So there's a lot you can learn about human nature from reading the Bible. And James said it's like looking into a mirror. One of the things I think that tells us a lot about ourselves when we look at the Bible is that it kind of lays this out for us, that the perfect situation isn't perfect. I could think of a couple of examples in Scripture that point this truth out to us. Two different groups of people. The first couple of people I think of are Adam and Eve. Think about it. Adam and Eve live in a garden together, naked, no kids. Seriously, how do you screw that up? <laughs> they did. They had it perfect. Everything was so perfect. You didn't even need to wear any clothes. That's how good the weather is. I mean, it's just perfect. You know, I mean, incredible situation. There they are. And yet, they were convinced that things could be better. That's why they ate the fruit. I mean, why would you eat the fruit? Why would you do it? God said, hey, don't eat that. It's, just, it's not going to be good for you. I need to check it out. There, you might be wrong. Think about that. They were convinced that there was something better, and it was perfect. Wow, that tells us so much about human nature that even if you had the perfect situation, you still would be unsatisfied. Another couple of people that come to mind, Peter and Judas. Think about Peter and Judas. Peter denied Jesus told Jesus to his face that he thought that him dying for the sins of the world was, was the wrong idea, that there was another way to do this. Peter did not believe that what Jesus was doing in the moment, that it was the right thing to do. Judas didn't believe in Jesus so much, he betrayed him. Two guys worked for the perfect leader. I mean, Jesus was perfect, never did anything wrong. So you can't be mad about your boss because he was perfect, and yet they were mad about their boss. Wow. It teaches us something about human nature. That's that the perfect situation isn't perfect. Even if you had it just the way you wanted it, you would still be unsatisfied. Do you know why? Because there's a hole on the inside of you that is so big that the perfect situation cannot fill it. That's why when you lean in the direction of seeking only the things that you don't yet have, you're bitter. You're unhappy. This is the reason why I want to encourage you, and all of us today, me, myself included, that we would lean in the direction of thankfulness. If for no other reason, this is a great reason for you to do it. And here it is. That thankful people are happier people. Have you noticed this? Thankful people are happier people. I've noticed this one. Thankful people are more generous. They're more loving. They're more caring. People who are thankful for what they have can give so much more. Here's why. Think about this. 
Remember your mom taught you to say thank you. Your grandmama taught you to say thank you. No, think about just what the simple act of thank you is. It's recognizing that what was given to you, whether it was a sandwich or a glass of water or a new car, whatever was given to you didn't come from you. It didn't start with you and it doesn't finish with you. It comes from someone else. That's why you say thank you. I say thank you because it came from somewhere else. See, thankful people are people who recognize that they're not everything in this world. They're just connected to so much more. Thankful people see the world as a gift. They see the way, they see their lives, they see all the good things in their life as gifts. And so therefore, they're not owners of everything that they have. They see themselves as stewards, as caretakers. It's interesting because when God put Adam and Eve in the garden, do you know what he told them that they were to do? To care for the garden. They were caretakers. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to see this world and everything that we get in it as a gift. We see it as a gift from God. That's what thankful people do. They see life as a gift. And because it's a gift, how can I hold on to it? How can I not pass it on? They see themselves as connected to something so much bigger. Think about it like this. I don't know if you knew this, but in Africa and South uh, East, Central, and Southwest Asia, there are about 741 million people, roughly, who don't have access to clean drinking water. About 3.4 million people will die this year uh, just because of water-related diseases. 3.4 million people. Now, I want you to imagine, when you go home today, you will think nothing of it, but just to turn on your faucet, clean water comes pouring out. It'll be nothing to you. You won't, you won't think twice about it. It's just a normal thing for you. But imagine that someone who came from this area where they didn't have access to clean drinking water, somehow, some way, they happen to come by your house where you've got your faucet, and they see that you've got water. Would it be anything to you to give them a glass of water? Would you think twice about it? No. None of us would be like, oh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to do that. Why? Because you've got access to so much more water. You don't know how it works. Maybe it comes under the ground, comes through pipes. You don't know where it is. But your, your faucet somehow, some way, is connected to what seems like a limitless source of water. So for you, it's nothing to give that away. Now think about it like this. Flip the situation around. What if you were one of those people who had to walk miles to find water? What if it was so difficult for you to find water that you could only find just a little bit at a time and maybe you had just found five gallons of what you thought was clean drinking water and you're on your way back to your house with your family and your kids and that same person comes up to you asking for a drink of water. It's a little bit different decision now, isn't it? Why? Because you don't know where you're going to get your next drink of water from. It was hard enough to find the water that you do have. This is the difference between what it is to be thankful and unthankful. Thankful people see themselves connected to something so much bigger than they are. That's why they can give. That's why they can be generous. That's why they can love big. Because they know that they have a limitless supply of love com coming from someplace else. Unthankful people see the world as starting and stopping with themselves. That if I don't do it for myself... Nobody else is going to do it for me. They feel like they clawed and scratched their way into everything that they have. And because they had to work so hard for it, I can't give it away. It's mine. It belongs to me. Thankful people see themselves as connected to so much more. If I've been loved so generously, how can I not help but to pass on love to other people? If I've been given to so generously, how can I not help but just to pass that generosity on. If God has been so good to me, how can I not be good to other people? Guys, Christian people should be among the most thankful people. I'm not even going to say among. I'm going to say we should be, period, the most thankful people on the planet for what God has done for us. How can we not help but pass that on. When you see yourself connected to something so much bigger than you are, how do you not let yourself become a conduit and say, God, let it pass right through me to other people? That's what it is to be thankful. And that's why thankful people are happier. 
That's why thankful people are more generous. That's why they're more loving. That's why they're more caring because they don't see themselves as the beginning and the end of everything that happens in their lives. They see themselves as a conduit through which they can freely give what was freely given to them. So here we go. Let's circle back around to the, where we started this thing. Lean toward thankfulness. I'm not telling you to give up your hopes and your dreams and wanting to start something new. I'm just telling you, as you go about this week, lean toward thankfulness. Lean in that direction. Instead of, instead of being upset about how your husband isn't or how, how your wife isn't, be thankful for what you do have. Live life in a way that you enjoy what you have right now. Some of you are trying to sell something. You're trying to buy something. You're trying to save up for something, and you feel like you can't be happy. I'm right there with you. I have a house for sale, and I have to tell myself, it's been for sale for a year and a half, by the way, and I have to tell myself regularly that I'm thankful for what I do have, that my happiness isn't predicated on me getting the next thing but that I can be happy and satisfied if I never sell my house. I'm happy with what I have because I have a connection to my great heavenly Father. The perfect situation you're looking for isn't perfect. Lean toward thankfulness. And here's what happens, and this is, this is what my hope and my prayer is for all of us, is that we could say what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 4. Many of you know these verses well. The Apostle Paul had been through a lot in his life, He'd been beaten, he'd been whipped, he'd been imprisoned, he'd been stoned, not recreationally, but with the rocks, you know, the, that, that kind of thing. <laughs> he'd, been, he'd been through a lot, shipwrecked, he'd been through a lot in his life. And look what he could say. This is interesting, what he said. He said this, he said, I have learned the secret, the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Do you know what Paul knew? He knew that his strength didn't come from what he could achieve. His strength came from being connected to one who was so much greater than he was. That's why he could be thankful and content, whether he had a lot or he had very little. He was thankful. Let's all purpose as we go into this week and this whole season to lean toward thankfulness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives and in our church. In fact, Lord, we just take a moment right now all over this place to just say thank you. Thank you for what we do have. Lord, we have dreams, we have hopes, we have goals and ambitions, but Lord, we're just going to set all that to the side for right now. We're just going to focus on you and just say Thank you. Thank you for what you've already done. We've come so far. You've done so much. Lord, let us never forget that our goal and our aim in all of this is you. Not all the things that we can achieve. It's you. It's having a relationship with you. Only you can fill us from the inside out. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in our church, for how you're enlarging our hearts for our community and for how you're working through us. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Hey, maybe you're here in this room or you're watching out at our south location, maybe in the lobby. I don't know where you're watching from, but you would say, you know what, Whit? I have never made Jesus the Lord of my life. I'm not a follower of Christ, at least in the way that you could say that you've experienced real life change. That's what we say here. We think that a real authentic relationship with Jesus always results in real life change, that you're not the same person you used to be. If that's you, and you'd say, hey, Whit, that's me. Today, I want to I I become a follower of Christ. Here's what I'm going to invite you to do. No matter where you're sitting, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. This is just called the Believer's Prayer. Would you just pray after me? We're all going to pray together. Just repeat after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place and to pay for my sins. But I thank you that he didn't stay on the cross, but that you raised him from the dead. And today I confess Jesus as my Lord. Jesus, I will follow you. I am your disciple from this day and forward. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, hey, let's give it up for everybody who maybe just prayed that prayer.
Hey, if you just prayed that prayer and you have never, uh, or you, for the first time, maybe for the first time in a long time, uh, I want to invite you to do something that Jesus said you should do. In fact, he said, when you become my follower, the first thing you need to do is you need to get baptized. There's a room right over here. We just call it our baptism room. We got shirts, shorts, towels, everything you're going to need to be baptized. Every weekend, dozens of people go in that room and they get baptized. It's just a, a way of saying that my old life is over and I'm starting new and afresh. That's what going under the water and coming back up out of the water means. It's not some mystical or magical thing, but it's just a symbol that says, you know what? I'm serious about this. And Jesus knew that if you wouldn't follow through with this, you won't follow through with the rest of the things he's going to ask you to do. He's got a great life in store for you. I just would pray you'd be bold enough to take this step. So grab somebody next to you, somebody in your section, your section leader after the service. Stop by our baptism room. Hey, tonight, guys, we had to cancel last week or postpone our, uh, our Christmas train volunteer rally. The weather's great today. We hope to see you here tonight at 6 p.m. If you're planning on volunteering and we still have some volunteer spaces available, we would love to have you. Even if you've not signed up, you can still come tonight. Be here at 6 p.m. We're going to have a great night. It's not going to be a boring meeting, I promise. There's cupcakes, there's some food, holiday music. We're going to have a great time. But we're going to get you ready, psyched up for the Christmas train, which starts this week. 60,000 people, guys, are coming through the gates of Dry Gulch. You get to be a part of it this weekend. So uh, be here tonight at 6 p.m. We hope to see you guys there. Hey, stand to your feet. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you guys. You're dismissed.